when you um, re replace u with its Fourier series, then uh, what happens is uh, um, you get an ODE, a second order ODE for u hat k. What's the Fourier coefficient? An opportunity for you to remember your BAP 285 stuff or whatever your first ODE course was. Um, we have to use a character equation and get two roots. And I'm going to write it, the, the kind of solution we'll get is uh, uh, well, this is a UK of T. So that'd be some constant, which is going to depend on K, so I'll write it like that. Although we don't really care what the constants are, but in general they would depend on K because they would relate to the initial data for the PDE, which is not given in this problem. Times exponential of um, some root, which again depends on K, times T plus another K dependent parameter E to the R2. Um, and these are the roots. of your character to the equation. Um, so the form of the solution, um, u of x t, is a sum over k of, OK, so the recording got interrupted, but the form of the solution is this, where r1 and r2 we find by solving a character equation, so it would depend on k. Hey, um, yeah. No, that is what today is for. Shouldn't the IK be squared? Um, oh, um, this part does not come from the ODE. Okay. There, now, there can be a K squared in there. Okay. But that, that, that that's lumped into the R1K, R2K. Okay. So, so the point is, once you figure this out, which, yes, there is an IK squared in there somewhere, um, it... Um, Regardless of what happens here, it gets all oh, multiplied by e to the i k x just because this is your Fourier series. Yeah. And we're just able to say more about what this part is. All right. Um, now, one way to check to make sure your R1 and K and R2K makes sense. See what happens if D goes to zero. If you set D equals zero, what you should get for uh, R1 and K, R2K should be the dispersion relation forming a wave equation, which is in the notes. UTT, and then in that case, the PT is reduced to UTT equals UXX. So you kind of check the consistency of your solution uh, that way. All right. Now, once you have this, the question is that now how do we interpret this? How, how what, what can we infer about how these waves, because all the, here we have these waves that were uh, superimposing on each other to construct a solution. How do these waves behave? And there are two parts to that. The first is shifts. Um, and, and the thing that troubles you, two criteria, shifts and amplitude, require different perspectives. So what you want to do is the expression that you already have, e to the i k x plus r i k T, where I equals 1 or 2, so you do it for both. Um, you want to write it in this form, E to the IK, and then you're, so you're going to have X plus, um, I'll call it some function, GI of K and T. 
And so whatever you get by forcing yourself to factor out an IK. Um, so this right here is the um, shift. And because there's a plus sign here, um, that indicates that's a shift to the left. Now, if it happened to be negative, then it would be a shift to the right. But uh, I'm just calling it left because I put a plus here. Um, now, um, to give an example from another PDE, um, the one-way wave equation, you get e to the i k, and you end up with n. This is a u t minus u x is equal to zero. You get e to the i k x plus t. So actually, factor out the i k. T is what you're left with. And because there's no k, we can call that a frequency independent shift. Because there was a k, but it got factored out. But if, there, if, a, if a dependence on k is more complicated than that, then what you get is likely to be frequency dependent. That's really the question, really what the problem is asking for, is... Um, Shouldn't it's Dependent velocities. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. While being damped with time. That's the second part. Okay. Yeah. I haven't talked about that yet. Oh, okay. Any questions about the uh, frequency fit of velocity bit? Um, yeah, because when it's frequency independent, that means that all the waves are moving together at the same rate. Um, so Whatever you have here indicates how fast each wave, the wave is shifting. Like if I was, instead of ut minus ux equals zero, if I had ut equal to c ux, c is an indicator of wave speed. The larger the speed is, the larger c is, that means, the faster these waves move. Um, so the larger this is, um, the faster that particular wave is traveling. Um, large in absolute value. So. Positive, the way I've written it, positive would mean to the left, negative would mean to the right. I have a question on the frequency. Right. Oh, um, just that the, um, yeah, but the, just that the solution has to be, if it's an interval 0 to 2 pi, for instance, uh, has to be a 2 pi periodic function like sine or cosine. Um, that um, the function and its derivatives um, must be equal at the endpoints. <clears throat> it's the most convenient kind of boundary condition, and which is why I use it in my research problems whenever I can get away with it, <laughs> because uh, then your solution tends to have a simpler form. Um, like, oh, I mean, like, uh, like if any kind of function k, like, if you yeah. that or as complicated as, yeah. as that, it makes it frequency um, dependent. Yeah, so, so after you factor out the ik, if what's left has any k at all, with the x or the t, or it would just be with the t. With right, the yeah, there will not be an x here. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, but if there's going to be a t dependence, if there's any k dependence at all, then it's frequency dependent. Um, and when you have that kind of k dependence, um, well, um, it depends on what else you have. Like, for instance, uh, if the overall exponent is still imaginary, but you have this k dependent shift, that's dispersion. And I started to distinguish from cases where this part, like what you uh, end up getting for um, this or this, um, if that has a, um, okay, actually it's kind of getting into my next part. 
Okay, I'll just cover it here. It's related to that. Um, so, <clears throat> if e to the r1 of k, or, or r i, it doesn't matter whether i is uh, 1 or 2, um, has an exponent, so really I'm looking at r i k t, that is, so there's um, several possibilities that can happen. So um, if it is um, purely imaginary, um, K independent, which is what happened here. Uh, well, it's what happens here, because it's what I have here is I K T. Um, no. Sorry, I need to be more careful here. Um, purely imaginary frequency independent shift. Like, um, like in this case, that is advection. Um, I should say pure advection. In other words, there isn't anything else going on. It's just advection. So I'm, I'm trying to describe the essential phenomena that we could have, at least when it's purely that. Um, if anything that doesn't fall in these categories is a combination of these effects. The next thing possibility is also purely imaginary and frequency dependent shift um, and that is uh, dispersion because what's happening is the waves are keeping their amplitude that's staying the same over time but because of the um, I here um, but they're all traveling at different speeds, so that causes dispersion. Um, on the other hand, if um, the exponent is real and uh, um, negative, then that is uh, damping. Is it because... Um um, the frequency, like the os oscillatory nature, has to decrease over time. Um, time is going on. Yeah, yeah. What's happening? Yeah, because it's, in other words, yeah, this part is a decaying exponential. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So. Okay. Well, I should say pure diffusion in all these cases. Um, all three. Now. If, you're, if what you have here does not fall neatly into one of those baskets, then it means you have a combination of these effects happening. For example, let's suppose that this has a real part and an imaginary part, but the real part is negative. Then you have damping going on, but you may also have either advection or, or dispersion going on. The problem, the second, the last part of a problem only asks um, is there damping or not? And the way you answer that question is, is the real part is the real part negative? Um, because if uh, if it is, then um, this is going to decrease in magnitude. Um, so what's going to happen is you get e to the z is e to the u plus e to the u times e to the iv, where u and v are the real imaginary parts. So z is u plus iv. And if this part is negative, then the whole thing is, um, I'll put a t here. It's going to zero 
as t goes to infinity. Um, and it doesn't matter what v is. So, um, so what that means is you need to look at your roots that you got in the beginning part of the problem from your characteristic equation. That depends on k and d. And you have to ask yourself, this, these roots, depending on the value of k and d, can be either real or complex. But what you need to check is, if you look at those two possibilities, look at, it, look at them separately. Case one, the discriminant is positive. Case two, the discriminant is, is negative. Um, can you show in those two cases that whatever real part you're going to get is still going to be negative? And once you do, um, then you've established that they're standard. write down a fourth possibility. There's a real part and it's positive. Then we have exponential growth. That is a ill-posed problem. So we just prefer to stay away from that. <coughs> well, unless we're doing image processing, then it might actually be desirable. <laughs> in a limited sense. Okay. So any questions about what's going on with with this problem or, or what needs to be shown. So the reason why I say we have two different perspectives, for the shift part, you want to factor ik out um, and look at what you have. For the other part, you just want to focus on, you, you want to leave it in this unfactored form and just look at this. Uh, because this right here, this, for i equals 1, 2, its absolute value is your amplitude as a function of k and t. <clears throat> so now for uh, the other problems, we get into uh, finite differences and Taylor expansion and MATLAB. Alright, so we have minus ux x equal to f um, on 0, 1. Then we have boundary conditions, e is equal to zero on the boundary. And you're given what f is, rather strange function, I think, but I didn't make it up. that um, you could find the exact solution um, by taking this and integrating it twice. Um, so if, I, if you temporarily forget about the fact that v is equal to this, you can figure by, uh, so to get u of x, Undo the product rule. So you, th you think of this as a, um, uh, as a result of a product rule. And you can backtrack from this to uh, like the antiderivative of this. And then you can do it a second time. Um, and you get a reasonably simple function for uh, when you, and then don't forget the minus um, afterwards. Um, so that's just something, so if you want to have an exact solution to compare against, um, you can do that. Um, although the problems aren't really about that, but it's, also, it's a good way, if you have an exact solution on hand, like check your code, make sure it's working. Um, okay. So I'm going to step through the 
parts of this problem. Um, okay, so it's really not until part B that we get to using all the actual code. Um, all right, so part A is about local truncation error. Um, now, um, so what's happening is your ODE minus two x is equal to f is being approximated by the uh, standard uh, difference that is given. Um, so, so we're using a um, uniform grid. Similar to um, the examples uh, worked on in class lately, um, so we have uniform uh, grid on uh, zero one, and um, what you have is I want to make sure I don't miss a minus sign on my definitions. That must be amber. Okay, finite differences. A U minus F. Okay. Uh, is equal to f of xi plus tau i, which is the local truncation error, LTE. Um, and this is for i equals 1 to up to uh, n. So what you're doing is at each interior point, well, actually, uh, yeah, at each interior point where you're trying to find a solution, you're using this approximation. Um, so this describes your matrix, where uxi plus h is approximated by ui plus 1. Uh, this is approximately ui, and this is approximately ui minus 1. Um, for setting up your system linear equations, solve a system. And this is abbreviated fi. Um, but for purpose of error analysis, Instead of using, setting up the system to solve for your computer solution, you're going to substitute the exact solution into the system of equations that will um, not satisfy it exactly. And what's left over is the local truncation error. Um, so what you're going to do, as suggested in the, the problem, is Taylor expand these. Um, and uh, around uh, xi. And then, so, and you have to, once you expand this uh, to a few terms, you have to use the fact that this u is the exact solution. So you use the fact that minus uxx is actually equal to f. You need that in order to get the f out of there. Uh, because what you're supposed to get for local truncation error is it's order h to a power times something. Um, and um, It's similar to the process we did with the norm, right? It's exactly the same thing. Yeah, well, except there's a negative h to the power. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, just yeah. making sure. Okay. <laughs> so this section is not, uh, you should just write it down like analytically. For part A, yes. Um, yeah, I realize uh, above that, oh, 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 okay, but above, above that it talks about coding. So I need to backtrack to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Um, because Parde also says, explain the observed error conversion trait. Because what the idea is, in this part, you're supposed to have a come up with an analytical expression for the local truncation error, and, it's, and it's to see the error is um, you know, h to the something. Uh, and based on examples and notes, you can guess what that something is supposed to be. Um, and therefore, if you write your code to solve this problem and you try it with different values of h, um, as um, h is getting smaller, it should be converging. So what I'm going to do is, uh, well, first, after I make sure there are no questions about this part, I'm going to talk about the code. Yes? Oh, um, one more question. Yes? I was going to say, like, my question was, like, can I use, like, the very small for uh, in the code? Like, because we're solving a linear system. Why don't I use max block? Okay, I mean, because I just wrote that solved. <laughs> like, do you care if I use that or, or do you, you, you like to write your own? Or? Yeah, or max. Cool, all right. <laughs> You don't have to. Um, okay. What what I really what I expected from a code that you would like do yourself is about setting up the system. Okay. I don't really care how you solve it. Okay. Cool. Like that. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, you want to do that? Not um, okay. Any questions about the analytical part before I talk about the code? I'm sure this wasn't what most people want to know about. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we refer to the computed solution, but this is the exact solution. Yeah, can I also say this is u of xi plus 1. Yeah. Any other questions about the analytical? There's different ways of doing this. I'll just put one way out there. What is A? What is F? Um, and then once you have those, then you can um, solve for uh, U. Now, the F part is easy. Um, you just substitute your uh, interior grid points into, um, uh, into a function that's given. That's sine phi of x. Um, prime of x with all that crap. Um, so, in fact, I would recommend you do a following. Where, and I, I'm typing for uh, writing down the MATLAB prompt. You could do it in a script if you want. In fact, that might be preferable. You define f this way as a function handle. Um, well, in fact, you can first define b if you want as a 9 pi times x. And what I'm going to do is, this is optional, but I'm going to recommend it. x dot squared. And the reason why is um, so that the function will work on a vector or a matrix. It, it doesn't matter what x is. Scalar, vector, matrix, it will work. Um, which is good for uh, plotting purposes, especially. Um, and then um, the uh, f of x describes, uh, it includes derivatives of phi. So in this case, since uh, phi has simple derivatives, I would recommend you just hard code those. 
So you might do something like B prime for uh, which would be uh, 18 pi x, etc. And then D double prime. This is just my naming convention. I don't care what naming convention you use, but So, uh, so you need to have those derivatives on hand. So then f, these are too much up a little. F would be also a function handle, and it would go something like this: sine of b of x, uh, and then dot star. B prime of x dot squared minus and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, again, so it's vectorized, so it'll work on a vector as well, but just yellow. Um, sure. Yeah. What I'm guessing in computational terms, but what would be the benefit of doing that rather than just like doing like a complete, but just like fill the vector x? Less cumbersome. Um, yeah, because then what you can do is, um, like if you define, you, you, if we assume that n is chosen, so you need, you need to specify a value for uh, n, the number of uh, interior grid points. Uh, but once you have that, um, and you have to define your, um, your uh, h, um, then as far as defining x, like your vector of your grid points, and we really only need the, well, okay, I'm going to define in terms of the interior grid points, um, that's going to be most convenient. You might even want to have another vector that has interior and boundary points. Hold on, I have to take this, sorry, it's on my car. Well, yes. Sorry about that. What? Yeah, it's only eight hundred dollars, but <laughs> yeah. Also, the things at first I said, oh, about three fifty. It's like okay, then oh, we need another part. What kind of name did you come with? Uh, Ford Fusion. Um, okay, so for um, if you want the interior points only, a quick way to divide it, but yeah, I mean, there's always other ways to do things, like writing a for loop that fills in x, but a quick way would be h times 1 to n, um, just do it all one shot. And the reason, and notice I put a transpose in here, because 1 to n, that's a row vector, but we would prefer to have a column vector, and the reason why is um, we want to substitute this into your function f to get your right hand side. And your right hand thought that your right hand side has to be a column vector. Okay. Um, so So f of x is your right-hand side. Um, now, um, you, now you need to call that something. You can call it whatever you want, just so you know it refers to your right-hand side vector. 
Um, and when you're solving ax equals b, that's, that's your b. Now, one way in which this problem simplifies things a little bit compared to examples in class, um, there are no boundary terms. We saw in an example hit in class where your right-hand side vector would generally just be your right-hand side function, except on the first term, the first element and the last element, I had to add things on because of this, you know, whatever difference you're using having boundary terms. The reason why, can anyone tell me, in fact, by looking at what's on the board, why that is not an issue this time? Well, because you're not dealing with the vector, right? Like you're asking why I don't have to add stuff on the add right. vector. Yeah, because yeah, you don't, I mean, we don't have a derivative, so we don't have to compare it to the um, well, um, even if we had only Dirichlet boundary conditions, it's generally an issue we have to have something to add on. But again, not in this case. So what was this? It says yes, it's because the boundary value is zero. Uh, so you could say, yes, you are adding boundary terms, but they're zero. So we love homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition problems <laughs> because they lead to uh, simpler right-hand sides. Okay, so you don't. Um, in other words, line? yeah. In other words, this is it. That's your right hand side. Yeah, there's no f no funny business with oh, except for first and last term, we gotta add these things on. There's nothing to add on. Okay, so one less headache. Um, I would still make. Um, so that's the right-hand side. There's nothing more to say about that. Um, now for the matrix, well, that's the matrix we've seen a few times in class already, um, the standard center difference. That's what's provided in the problem statement. Um, and um, there are several ways to make this matrix that you might be familiar with. For instance, I mean, of course, you can always write. Negative, like it needs to, you know, you need to switch the sign. Yeah. Or okay. okay. Whoops. <laughs> Probably not the last time you're going to make a mistake. Um, okay, yeah, so minus times the second derivative matrix. Um, now, um, Ways to make a matrix. Um, thank you. Um, for instance, you could just write four loops that fill in certain elements, like A, I, I equals this. But that's pretty common. You can also use the uh, diag functions. Um, or, like, or, like, for instance, you could have, for a diagonal, you can have the multiple of identity. I mean, you can use a diag to handle the super and sub diagonals. What I would recommend is to actually use. MATLAB sparse matrix features. Um, so we could um, create this matrix in one statement using uh, sparse matrix features is, uh, well, you have a minus 1 over h squared in appropriate MATLAB syntax times sp diags and um, well, first, before you do that, you need a vector of ones of length n. Um, so once you create that, then this statement that I've used in many cases, um, create the matrix. And I'll explain what it does. Um, so it's actually easier to explain the arguments from right to left. Um, the n and n tells it the size of a matrix you want. Um, the minus 1, 0, and 1 tells you which diagonals you want to fill. And a similar convention as in diag. Zero refers to the main diagonal. One, the positive values are super diagonals. Negative values are sub diagonals. 
So this is saying, whatever is here, put it on the first subdiagonal, main diagonal, first super diagonal. Um, and then the first argument is what you are actually putting on these diagonals. A vector of all ones, a vector of all minus twos, a vector of ones. Um, Yeah, yeah, you can place these wherever you want. Um, now, here's the, the strange thing. Um, that, of course, the main, this is an n by n matrix. The main diagonal will have n elements. The super and sub diagonal will have only n minus 1 elements. But it still forces you to choose past the vector of length n. Um, not sure why. It's just kind of weird. Um, but that's just how this function behaves. So at least for creating matrices like this, where all the entries along the diagonal have the same value, it's, uh, um, it's pretty convenient. Um, but uh, I, suppose we did an example in class where there were um, variable coefficients. So you had different values on each row because of the coefficients. And that would affect what I put in here. And I also couldn't tell you, because I haven't done it, um, how you would have to set up those vectors to make that work and get the result you want. I could, you know, I'd have to like look up sp diags or try it out and see how it um, how it works. But at least for matrices for like this, it's convenient uh, because um, now um, another way in which you can always create a sparse matrix is. Um, I'm going to confirm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, One of the favorite ways of creating sparse matrices that are more general, um, where they don't have some nice structure to them. A is equal to sparse I, J, and S where i is a vector <laughs> of row indices, j is a vector of column indices, and s is a vector of actual entries. All these vectors have the same length. So MATLAB will just take these vectors and say, OK, in, as it goes through each element of these vectors, it says, OK, in this row, this column, put this number. So uh, if you wanted to do that using this matrix, you can make, uh, like for instance, i and j entries being equal and equal to minus uh, equal to two over h squared, uh, and then a bunch of ones like two one three two four three like the sub diagonal entries to put minus one over h squared. Then similar for the uh, super diagonal, just make those vectors and pass them in, um, and this usage will automatically size the matrix to the maximum row or column entries that you have. Um, so if you use it for this matrix, it will give you the right size. Yeah. Uh, is there any relation between SP, Diag, uh, and um, sparse matrix? Um, well, it, it creates a sparse matrix structure. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's why it's, anything like function like this that has an SP uh, indicates sparse. <laughs> Just like we have I and SPI for identity matrix uh, full and sparse versions. Um, is any of you, if you have um, worked with a, a sparse matrix, this is something that came up in, in your research, where you run the same algorithm but with a full matrix versus a sparse matrix, the sparse one matrix version is so much faster. Um, just because it's not having to do all the zero entries, you don't have that storage that you're incurring. And it wouldn't be a huge deal in this case, unless you chose n to be like a million. But, um, Okay, so, and again, there are other ways to create the matrix, but this is one way that, uh, that you could do it. Um, so, uh, any questions about the right-hand side or matrix setup? Um, this brings me back, yeah. So, A is the right-hand side. No, not A, F. F is the right-hand side. A is a system matrix. 
So, but I mean, you have right hand side here and then minus fx. It means that. No, 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 no. Okay. Bye. Sorry. That was a dash. <laughs> So, matrix, right hand side, backslash, um, or a function of your writing. Um, okay, wait, you did that. Um, okay, now back to the last part of part A. It says. Um, Plane be observed conversion rate. Um, here are some things that you can do uh, because, uh, well, first, what you want to do is um, you want to solve it for different values of n. Um, like as n increases, therefore h decreases. Um, you get different solutions. You, you should observe like convergence, um, and you can plot them. Like you already have your vector of x's, and you can go ahead and plot them against u. Um, now this will only plot the interior points because x, the way I've written it, only includes the interior points. Here's a way you can modify that. If you want to include the boundary points, just tack on like for uh, x, put a zero at the beginning and a one at the end, and then for u, u is supposed to be zero on the boundary, so put a zero at the beginning and a zero at the end. Um, so for interior and the boundary. For this case, it will be the same because it's zero. Right? Uh, well, yeah, it'll pretty much look the same. It's that, yeah, on the second case, the curves will be drawn out a little further to actually see that it's zero. But, yeah. Um, so it's up to you. That's how you want to plot it. Um, now, um, you should define, like I said earlier, for this case, for this given f of x, you can figure out the exact solution by uh, undoing the product rule. So if I make a variable and call it u exact, that's also a function handle. So you can fill in that there for comparison purposes. Um, so then what you can do after that is, let's suppose you've already plotted your computed solution. So then you can do a hold on, and you can uh, do a plot of um, x, u exact of x, like in a different color, like maybe plot in red. Um, and then you can compare the two. And if your method's correct, they should pretty much sit right on top of each other. Um, I mean, depending on how many grid points you use. Um, Uh, what you can also do is you can compute error, like a norm of uh, your computed solution u, which, uh, and then minus the exact. Um, and so then you can get the uh, actual error, and the question is, how does this go to zero? as h goes to zero. Um, if you determine that your finite difference method is order h squared, if you increase n by a factor of two, the error should decrease by a factor of roughly four. Is that actually happening? So that's what the, the last part of part A is about, explain the observed convergence rate. From a Taylor expansion, you get an idea of what the theoretical convergence rate should be. Are you getting that um, in this case? So 
all kinds of ways to see how well it's working. And, and certainly for a scheme like this, um, where your f of x has derivatives, there's no differentiability issue there, you should get something that is quite accurate. Um, one, I mean, if you're only choosing like you know five grid points, maybe not, but um, there's no reason you can't use, if the computer's doing heavy lifting, to just choose like you know, 100 grid points. In that case, they really should closely resemble one another. Uh, if not, that's a sign that there's something wrong with, with uh, your code or your formula for the exact solution. <clears throat> Any questions about this? Okay. Um, let's have a break at this point and then I will continue talking about the other parts. The rest of this. Um, all right. Now. Um, so excuse me. I have a question related to the previous one. Okay. The example we calculated, like ESPM. No, 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 no. Um, okay. On paper. Okay. Because you give it f of x. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, part B, fourth order convergence. You need to find the uh, uh, stencil. And um, so this is like the example we did in class, where you have a matrix, like in the a third three point case, you have that. Um, then you have like h minus h and h squared. And that gives uh, one, zero, zero, two, uh, like that. that. That was for the second order stencil for second derivative. So now what you need is. Um, use these points, x naught, x naught plus or minus h, x naught plus or minus 2h. So now it'll be a, um, uh, okay. So you can, this would call for a five point stencil for the uh, second derivative. Um, and the symmetry also helps to get four four x using um, uh, fewer points. So, so now what you're going to have is uh, solve this system where you have um, like you know, all, all the values in your stencil, which would be a zero, a one, a two, a three. A4 must sum to zero. Um, your third element is still going to be two because you want the second derivative, and, and the, that order of derivative factorial is what goes in there. Everything else is zero. Um, and then for your next row, you have zero, h minus h, 2h minus 2h. Um, and then going down through there, taking powers. Of these. Um, now, there's two ways you can handle solving the system. One is, well, go ahead and work it out by hand, <coughs> or five by five, because um, it's not exactly sparse. Or what you can do is you can set up this system. If, like, if you let h equal one throughout, then you just have numbers in here. Put that system in the MATLAB and solve it. And at least you would get the coefficients. Um, and then you just have to remember in your formula, your factorial formula, you get to divide by h squared um, because it's for a second derivative. Um, so, um, but what I would suggest if you're going to solve it in MATLAB, <coughs> do this first format rat for rational. So here are the coefficients as fractions rather than decimals. Um, okay. 
So, yeah, so here you would just have you know, zero in the first column and then powers of these guys as you go from one row to the next, all the way down to the um, fourth power. I'm not sure that bothers me so much that the A2 is the A2 to the one in the A2. So it's not like countless nothing here. Um, well, it, as long as this is sort of consistently with this, then it doesn't matter how you look. Um, and so as long as this is associated with x naught, x naught plus h, x naught minus h, then it's okay. <coughs> okay. Um, now. Something just occurred to me here. Um, okay. Because this would give you the stencil for the interior points. But then there's a matter of what about the boundary points? Um, like, because, uh, for instance, if I go back to, and yeah, sorry, I just didn't think about this before. Like in this case, say for your first boundary point, first interior point, you have a boundary value here, and that's zero, so you leave it out. Um, but then, um, in the case of a four quarter, you're going to have five coefficients all together. It's going to be a pentadiagonal or five diagonal matrix. So you're going to have you know these three diagonals, so be different values, and then one more up here. And down here, and um, you don't have any. Um, in this case, you're like going two off the edge. Um, like the value right next to it, you can say, okay, that's zero because of the boundary condition. Uh, but for the one to the right of it. Now, okay. Um, so, what I would suggest is um, to use a different stencil. At the boundary, you can use, um, for example, x naught, x naught plus h, x naught plus 2h, x naught plus 3h, x naught plus 4h. So then all those are included. You get five entries in your matrix. And then your matrix looks like this. Right hand side is the same. So, so if, I, if this goes with a0, a1, a2, a3, a4, then you'd have in your second row, h, 2h, 3h, 4h, and then you have h squared, 2h quantity squared, 3h <coughs> quantity squared, 4h quantity squared, and so on. Um, and then those entries are what you would put in the first row of your matrix. Um, so you could do that for um, the leftmost boundary then for rightmost boundary point, it's the same except h is replaced by minus h throughout. So you have minus h, minus 2h, minus 3h, minus 4h, and my, every, everything from the um, second row on down, you replace h with minus h and get a stencil to get your matrix entries for the last row. So that would work. So I guess you get some experience dealing with one side of the stencil than the other. Um, for the second and second to last rows, you could still use the centered stencil um, because the boundary values <coughs> are zero. So you don't need to change those. Okay. So, uh, unexpected wrinkle there. Right, you do. Okay. Um, and what you should observe, hopefully, as you, if you go back and compute the solution the same way as in the previous part, what happens to the error as h goes to zero? It should be four-folder accurate, in theory. Um, so 
So if h decreases, it decrease n by a factor of 2, so h decreases by a factor of 2 roughly, then the error should decrease by a factor of 2 to the 4 for 16. Um, so it is a C if that um, actually happens. Um, one thing that's said in the problem, error convergence plots. Um, so what I'll suggest is since you can compute the error using what I described earlier, um, use the log log command uh, and plot the um, like the number of grid points versus your error. And as n increases, you should see the error um, actually. So as h decreases, the error should decrease. Because if the error is like order h squared, then you should see a, um, a line that has a, um, a, a, a log log plot should have a <coughs> line of slope of 2. If it's 4 for accurate, it should be a line of slope of 4. So we'll see if we actually uh, get that. <coughs> so any questions about part okay. um, part C you go back to the matrix from the first part of the problem right-hand side. So Fi is your right-hand side from before, but you add this term on, h squared um, over 12, f double prime f i h. And now the thing is, um, you because you're given f of x, you can compute f double prime, um, a ping i then. So what, what, what you're best off doing is, um, oh, actually, you know what? No, I'm not going to make you do that. Because um, it's d squared f, where this is your your uh, second derivative matrix from before. And you, and you have f as a vector. So you use that to approximate the second derivative. Um, because this will give you a second derivative f with order h squared error, but that h squared error is multiplied by h squared again, thus giving you h to the fourth error. OK, so that's will take a lot of work. Um, OK, so now you're going to go back and solve the system just with this, for the same matrix, just this different right-hand side. And then. You want to plot the error again versus h um, it should have a slope of 4 it's theoretically it's supposed to give four quarter accuracy um, but what we also want to do is plot the error from part B On the same plot, they should both have the same slope. What you should get are two parallel lines. But which one has the, like whichever one is below, that has, um, that's about the um, error constant. Because so that's something that's multiplying the h to the fourth. So, so which line is below the upper line? That'll tell you which one really is more accurate because it has a smaller error constant in there. So the idea of part b and c is, <coughs> two different ways to achieve 4-4 accuracy, 
um, which turns out to be more effective. <coughs> um, as far as proving Um, what happens in the previous Taylor expansion, you have this determinant of order a squared plus number terms, and you have to show that by Taylor expanding this, you can get that term to cancel out. That's, that's the idea. Um, um, finally, part D, there's not much to say about that one. You have a right hand side that's discontinuous, therefore, it's really easy. Um, so you, you can't necessarily expect the same convergence behavior, but we want to see what sort of convergence behavior do you get? Um, do you get uh, convergence at all? Um, and uh, what you can do, let's see. Um, well, since the, uh, your function is 1 up to x equals 1 half and then 0 after that, um, so, if you like integrate twice and negate it, you can get an exact solution. Um, but you have to make sure like, you, have these, you have these constant integration. You have to make sure that the boundary that is equal to zero on the boundary. Um, what do you say about um, because the right hand side is just continuous function doesn't have to be <coughs> uh, derivatives. Now, the solution can still be continuous. Uh, in fact, we'll have a continuous first derivative also, but because minus u x is equal to f, we now see that the second derivative is not continuous. So if the smoothness is, is limited, that means that in your, like your Taylor expansion, uh, like the higher order derivatives of f are not necessarily uniform. So if you try like, plotting a solution against x for certain values of values of uh, n. Do you see convergence at all? Or do you get some sort of bad behavior? Here? Let's see how this is all plugged out. Um, now with uh, number three, on 0, 1. u is equal to 0 at the boundaries, and its derivative is 0 at the boundary. Um, and um, so if you want to try some approach to um, do a solving it, so you need a stencil. So the fourth derivative Use like five points, which you need as a minimum. You're actually going to have the same matrix set up for the uh, as in the uh, um, previous problem for making a fourth order stencil. The difference is your right hand side for fourth derivative. What should the right hand side be? Zero, zero for the four at the bottom? Not four, but. Mm -hmm. Same with the last one. Not two either. The last one will be two. No. The last one will be non zero, but it won't, it won't be two. That's what the pattern is. Not four, but four. Oh, is it four factorial? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Four factorial. And you're given that f is equal to a constant, f is equal to 24. So what you can do is you can find the exact solution by integrating four times. And you have four constants of integration that must satisfy these boundary conditions. Um, that's how you can get an exact solution uh, to compare these. Uh, 
Um, now, here, with his five-point stencil, he set up a matrix, you get a five-diagonal matrix. And you have a similar boundary issue, except unlike the previous problem, you're only given two boundary conditions, um, exclusion equals zero at the endpoints. Here, the derivatives are also equal to zero at the endpoints. And um, you can use that to, um, now, this uh, stencil here is um, due to the symmetry is only going to be uh, second order accurate. So, um, so, so, so what you can do is, um, so you do for boundary conditions, you know that u zero is zero, and you also know that u n plus one is equal to zero. Um, but let's suppose we're at. Uh, like i equals 1, so your first row, you're going to have, um, so the solution values you need are like u1, u2, u3, for which you'll have matrix entries, and then you'll also have u0, which you know is 0, and then u minus 1. Because it's a five-point stencil, you go off the edge by 2. And we need to know, like, well, what can we do about that? In order to, because um, we need to eliminate that, we need to express u minus one in terms of values that we actually have. Um, so, one way you can do that is the following: that um, u prime at x naught is equal to zero. So I can approximate u prime by a centered difference, u of h minus u of minus h. So this is center difference for derivative at zero. So what that means is I can say u one equal to u, u of minus one is equal to u of one. So in other words, these are equal. So whatever coefficient you get in your stencil over here, you can assign to that one. So you can just add those coefficients together because they're multiplying the same value. Um, so that solves your boundary problem at the left boundary. On the right boundary, it's the same idea. That u prime of 1 is equal to 0. So you can use a second order center difference. u of 1 plus h minus u of 1 minus h over 2h. You can say that's 0. Therefore, u n plus, let's see, un the last interior point, un plus 2 is equal to un. So you can add those coefficients from your stencil together. I can't be more concrete, concrete until you actually compute the stencil. Um, but this gives you a way to uh, deal with the um, boundary values. Your right-hand side vector will just be the value 24. Yeah, this corresponds to the, like a first grid point. Okay. And this is a first grid point past the left boundary. Okay, so you can use the first grid point. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm solving that. Okay, so it's down here. So that would be n plus 1? Um, well, um, the n plus first grid point, yeah, you're evaluating the derivative there. That's equal to 1. So this corresponds to u n plus 2, and that corresponds to u n. Um, and this is the u prime at x n plus 1. So at least this is a second order accurate approximation. It should preserve your order of accuracy of the For okay, yeah, see what happens um, <coughs> convergence wise. That's uh, h goes to zero. Um, I would expect second order accuracy because of the symmetry. Um, also, I mean, there's no issues with discontinuities or anything. Um, so, do you actually um, uh, end up getting this? Um, 
so since your f is a constant, your solution is actually a fourth degree polynomial. Um, and because um, 0 and 1 are double roots, that means x squared occurs twice. You have x squared your factorization. You also have x minus 1 your factorization. So in fact, your solution is x squared times x minus 1 squared times a constant to make sure that the um, fourth derivative is equal to 1 degree. <coughs> so you can have another variable like in the previous problem, u exact, to plot the exact solution, plot your numerical solution, to make sure that you're equal. So kind of a map. Essentials. That's why I don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, the class is crunched in two minutes, so I don't care. <laughs> well, and, um, well, how are we doing? Okay. Well, first of all, I didn't any more questions about any problem. At least some of you are able to um, you know, really go at this today. And then tomorrow, we'll just see where you're at. Uh, because I, I don't want to move forward until people are in some decent shape. Uh, and uh, have, have to wait and talk to people. So, because um, no, I, I can see myself getting in a situation where you know, I get to the end of what I want to cover, there's a few days left of time. Um, and what I'm hoping is that after you all uh, get through this stuff, even though the other problems will be on later problems in a different technique, that at least you'll get your feet wet and get involved in setting up the effects and stuff. And that's that. This is actually why I wanted to offer this class, so that these kind of things would be would uh, eventually become second nature. <laughs> eventually. So bring any questions, uh, additional questions tomorrow.